Good morning, everybody. We're so glad that you're here this morning. I have a couple of announcements, so perk your ears up. First of all, we just want to let you know that we're so glad that you're here this morning, and we're thankful that you chose the churches for your morning service. The first one is going to be the Move Shifting Paradigm cards. Um, there's some maybe in your seats. I'm looking around, maybe not. Um, definitely there's some outside, capital M-O-V-E, Shifting Paradigms. We just want a record of, you know, who's, who's here, who's coming a lot. We want you to turn that in. If you haven't turned it in, do so. If you need one, you can get one from Tim. Um, and it's a tearaway card, so you'll keep half, you'll turn in half, and just a reminder for you to pray for the church as we move along with the building. Speaking of the building, lots of things are um, coming up over there. The building is moving along. The sheetrock was hung on the high areas. I'm not sure what that means. That's just what Dad wrote on the thing. But um, <laughs> the sheetrock is hung, I guess, up, in, up high. Um, electrical and plumbing and insulation is underway. Um, and the windows of the existing building where we are now have been blocked up in pre preparation for new things coming up over there. So um, every week as you come in, I'm sure you can see that there's a lot of new changes. And if you're like me, you have no idea what you're looking at. So I'm just trying to give you an idea of hopefully what it is that we're doing. Um, we will begin a plan to introduce life groups coming up. It's just a little plug. Our life group, um, me and my husband and Ben and Kari Downs and Grant and Lauren Barnett teach us a small group on Sunday mornings. It'll be at 9 a.m. We're going to start back on November 1st, the same Sunday as the Fall Festival. It's coming up on November 1st. It's a Sunday evening from 4 to 7. If you have small kids or your friends have small kids or your grandparents have small kids, whatever. If you know anybody with small kids, you want to bring them or big kids. Or if you don't have kids and you like food, I'm sure there'll be food there too. Um, so you'll come out at 4 o'clock. It'll be from 4 to 7 at the Museum of Appalachia. And it's at the Norris Clinton exit. So if you come out on Emory Road, go north, and you'll hit the Norris Clinton exit. You go off to the right. Um, it'll be a lot of fun, 4 to 7, November 1st. So I don't see anybody writing it down. Write it down, November 1st in your calendar, 4 to 7. Um, we're also going to be launching a new winter service schedule on November 1st as well. Because as you can see inside, the, the more weeks that go by, the more people are coming in. Um, so we're going to continue to have the 9 o'clock drive-in. We'll do the 1030 inside, but then we're also going to open up an early service at 8 o'clock. So I have an 8 o'clock early service, which is really early. But um, some of y'all, y'all, you got it, 8 o'clock in here. Um, also, the Walk for Life is coming up on October 10th. If you need information about that, you can see Tim Stallings. We say that a lot. He's a real tall guy, kind of have graying hair with glasses. Um, we say sometimes he doesn't have glasses. <laughs> Real tall, though. Real tall. His name's Tim. He's always out in the lobby, some, usually holding, like, the offering bucket at the 9 o'clock drive-in service. Um, he's walking around all the time. So when we say Tim, that's who we're talking about. But Walk for Life, it's going to be on October 10th at 10, or 8.30 in the morning um, at the Melton Hill Marina. So if you want information about that, you can see him. If you don't want to walk, you can donate. There's other people that are walking. You can donate towards um, their cause. Um, so just get involved that way. Also... There's a lot. I'm sorry. Um, is that it? There's a family mission trip coming up in Kentucky. It's in November. I don't have the dates written down, but see Clark outside um, at the youth station, and he'll be able to tell you about that. It's for ages 6th grade and up. So because we're inside and there's COVID, give everybody some air high fives. Turn around, say hey to about 10 other people, and as the band comes up and starts, we're so glad you're here and hope you all have a great time. Chains you overcome. You 
should I ever need remind of how I've been set free? There is a cross that bears the burden where another died for me. There is another in the fire.
you are in our midst, Lord, and you're in the fire with us, Father, with whatever we go through, Lord. I thank you for Pastor Joel as he brings a message for us. Uh, help us have open ears and hearts to receive what you have for us this morning, Jesus. I pray. Amen. opportunity to worship a great God this morning. Amen? Amen. Amen. I hope you didn't miss that opportunity. I want to tell you something. God is always watching and he's waiting and he's anxiously anticipating those moments when we just kind of forget about the world, stop focusing on the junk, our stuff, and we just look to a great God in awe and amazement of who he is. And when we do that, He's right there waiting. Man, when, he sh when, he, when we show up to where he's already waiting, he touches us and things change. And it'll change our perception of the world we live in and the troubles that we have. And so we're going to see more of that today. How do we live a life well when the world seems to be caving in around us? Now watch this. If you've ever had like moments that turned into days, that turned into weeks, that seemed like seasons where everything seemed to start piling up in your world against you. If, you ever, if you've ever felt that, say, I have. See, we're not alone. And, and today we're going to look back 2,600 years ago. Things don't change. It's always the same. And, and, and 2,600 years ago, we're going we're gonna to be reminded that things can always be worse. And we're going to do a flyover of the world of these little Hebrew boys, man. They were teenagers who got moved away from their home, emasculated, re-educated, redefined, and reprogrammed. Their world was flips up, flipped upside down. Nothing comfortable anymore in their world. And so how do you live in that? Okay, what a beautiful story we're going to see. And so last week we be began chapter 2, and the title of the message is just this. Seriously? Because sometimes that's how we feel, right? When the world caves in around, it's like, seriously? More junk in my life? Well, they have every reason to look to God and say, seriously? And so last week we saw first big problems. And big problems are uh, common to everybody. You just heard people say, yeah, I felt that. And so our theme, our verse for last week, uh, or, or the, kind of the, the thing that if we had to summarize big problems, it's this. God is not fair, but he's always just and right. And you need to remember that. He's not always fair, but he's always just and right. You don't want a fair God. Trust me. A fair God condemns us to death, hell, and the grave. But he's not fair. He's merciful and gracious and good and just and right. So then we moved on and we said, so big problems are for everybody. But when we look at big problems from God's perspective, when we back away and let God look at it, he sees big problems as big possibilities. And big possibilities, the, the, I guess the phrase would be our decisions to live well today determine our ability to live well tomorrow. So don't start don't, uh, don't wait for tomorrow to start pursuing holiness in your life today. Live for God today, and it will change our ability to live well for God tomorrow. And so then thirdly, we saw that when, when we have big problems, God sees them as big possibilities. So how do we tie the two together? How do we make a problem become a possibility? It happens through big prayers. We saw in, in Daniel chapter 2, as soon as Daniel found out, uh, that they were going to kill all, kill all of them, dismember them, and, and destroy their homes. He went to his boys, his, his, you know, his, his, his circle that also knew God, and he said, hey, man, circle up. It's time for prayer time. And that's what they did. They prayed to God about their problem that it would become a possibility. And so the point of that is prayer is not a last resort. It's a first response. And often in our world, it's 911 prayers, right? You know, it's where's the, where's the hotline? Where's the quick button? Where's the red phone? Because I got a problem. That shouldn't be, it shouldn't be a last resort. Prayer should become our first response to every situation that we have. So we got big problems. They become big possibilities when we lift up big prayers to a big, big God. That's what we learned in the first half of, of chapter 2. Now we're going to look at the second half because it will continue. And it's still called seriously, 
Point number four, big praise. Big praise. Now, I want you to see what the response is. When we pray, this is our response when God hears our prayer. Look what it says. It says, beginning in verse 20, he's praising. This is Daniel, and he says, Let the name of God be praised forever and ever, for wisdom and power belong to him. It goes on, it says, he changes times and seasons. He deposes some kings and he establishes others. He gives wisdom to the wise. He impacts, imparts knowledge to those with understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light resides with him. He goes on and he says, O God of my fathers, I acknowledge and glorify you. He says, for you have bestowed wisdom and power on me. He says, now you have enabled me to understand what I requested from you. For you have enabled me to understand the king's dilemma. Remember that one. So, here's what happens in this verse. He begins and he just praises God. He says, Daniel got a vision in the night. So let me tell you how I've got big problems. God sees them, big possibilities. We offer up big prayers. Look for answers. Look for answers. Often we pray to God and we never look for answers. We need to journal our answered prayers. We need a record, a, a, a tabulation of all of God's answered prayers <clears throat> because that's what builds our faith. Because over time we say, no big deal, I can pray. And even if the answers don't look like our answers, when we know that God has answered, we, put more, we have more trust. It builds our faith. It builds our relationship with a God who loves us. We begin to realize he's actually listening to my prayers. And, and so Daniel prays, and, and he, in the night he gets a vision. Everything he requested comes to him. And so God begins to make possibilities out of his problems. But notice he says, he says in that everything belongs to him. He takes no credit. And often what we do when things start getting better in our life, we hit a crisis, and then we pray maybe, and then things get better. Instead of saying, wow, God... You are amazing. We start kind of thinking, I'm pretty good. I kind of got this fixed myself. No, we didn't. No, we didn't. God is working in our lives, and we need to give him credit for what he does in our life. And it will begin to help us understand the problems of this world are possibilities when we realize how big God really is. And so listen what he says. He says he changes times and seasons. He deposes and establishes kings. Daniel says Nebuchadnezzar is the king. But God is God. And Nebuchadnezzar is only a king because God has sovereignly in his providence allowed Nebuchadnezzar to be king for a season. It says he deposes. That word means it's, there's some kings God just says that's enough with you. And he forcefully and quickly removes them from office. It means, and he says, and some he establishes. He runs some off and he puts some in. Because at the end of the day, God has a plan. At the end of the day, God is working his agenda for the good and the glory of himself and for our benefit. And so uh, it's like, I don't know if you know, but we are in an election season. Anybody aware of that? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Between the flags and the signs and the television and the, and the, and the debate that's coming up on Tuesday, which I will be watching maybe for entertainment value. I don't know. But I will watch that. And, 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 and in November, I will cast a vote. I will cast a vote for the person that most, let me just go ahead and say that, that most of the two, you got two options, the third option, not to vote, is not an option. So, so the one that lines up most with my convictions, okay, that's the one I'll vote for. And you'll vote for the one that most aligns with your convictions, okay? But at the end of the day, all that vote is, is an exercise of my conscience and my conviction and my liberty as an American citizen. At the end of the day, God determines who will be in the Oval Office. And so, no matter who wins, whether the one who wins is the one that we voted for or not, God is still God. And he's still on his throne, and everything's going to be okay. And that, isn't, that, isn't that encouraging to know that no matter what happens on this earth, God is still on his throne. And he cannot be shaken, and he cannot be moved, and he cannot be changed, and his plan will not be thwarted. His plan will be fulfilled. So God is large and in charge over those who think they are. <clears throat> That's the bottom line. God is large and in charge over those who think they are. Now he goes on and he says this. He says he gives, he imparts, he reveals, he knows, because light resides in him. How, how, listen to how giving God is. 
I want you to know this. There's sometimes that we think, well, I'm not going to ask God because that's selfish on my part. You can ask God anything. He's big enough for your questions. You can request of God to provide anything in your world because he's God and he's, he, he, it's not something he hasn't heard before. Okay, Dan, you're not going to pray to God tomorrow and say, God, I need you to do something big in my life. This is what I need in my life and my family. And God's not going to call the angels in and Jesus and the Spirit say, can you believe the audacity of Big D coming in here with a request like that? I've never seen this before. God, God that's not God. God's heard for, for, for all of, of time that humanity has existed. Men and women have walked with God, pursued God, prayed to God, requested of God. And listen to your pastor, it's okay. It's not selfish when you go before a God who is an agape, self-giving God. Demonstrated through Jesus, his son on a cross. There's nothing he is... Is, and there's nothing you can ask for that he doesn't embrace you. Now, he may not grant your every request because he's not, uh, he's not the genie in the bottle. You know, you know, I need this. You know, let me get my genie out. He's not the genie. He's God. But you can trust him with all of his answers, and he will answer your prayers. And, and then at the end, I love this line. I want to encourage you today. He says, thank you for giving me the answer. I can now understand, listen, the king's dilemma. Hold the phone. Daniel and the sorcerers and the magicians and the Babylonian uh, uh, witches and the Hebrew boys, the edict had been given for Arioch to kill them. He says, if they don't tell me what my dream was and interpret it for me, we're going to execute them and destroy, uh, excuse me, we're going to dismember them, cut them up into pieces and destroy their homes. It sounds like Daniel should have a little bit of a dilemma, right? But Daniel doesn't look at it that way. Daniel looks at it and says, hey, this is the king's dilemma. I want you to understand something. When you, when you consider 2020, which sounds like it should be a great year just by the number. 2020, man, the year of vision. 2020, the year where, you know, everything is, has clarity, you know, and, and all that. And, wah, 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 that didn't happen. And so when you consider COVID-19, when you consider social injustice, when you consider political unrest, when you consider anarchy, when you consider the stuff that we talk about, the stuff we see on the, on the news, listen, that's not my dilemma. That's not your dilemma. Daniel got it right. All of that stuff is the world's dilemma. Because I want you to know something. As a child of God adopted into the kingdom through Jesus' his son, we, although we are residents of this world, we're citizens now of another world. This is, we're just passing through, man. We're just on a journey. For some of our journey, it might last just a few years, and, 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 and death comes prematurely. For others of us, we might journey for 80, 90 years, okay? Uh, and, and, and at the end of the day, we're just pilgrims kind of passing through, okay? We're residents, but we're not citizens. And so the dilemma is not ours. Listen, well, how can I say that? How do I know the dilemma is not mine? How did Daniel know the dilemma is not his, but it was the king's? It was the, it was the lost world out there. That's who has a dilemma. Here's why. Because at the end of the day, you ready? One day, Jesus is going to come a second time. And when he comes a second time, I go to be with him forever time. And so the, this world passes away. Because God is ultimately king and he will fully demonstrate it on this earth through his people one day. We don't have a dilemma. The world has a dilemma. We've been delivered from the dilemma. That's a good line right there. All right? Now, let's keep going because uh, we've got a lot of ground to cover. Uh, Daniel realized it's all about God when he praised God. When he praised God, things happen. Th this is what Daniel knew. Now, I'm going to get real uncomfortable with you. For a guy, this is real uncomfortable. This is real uncomfortable for, for a guy to get on his knees, okay? We feel like somebody's going to chop our head off, take our wallet, and rape our family, okay? I mean, it's just something about it for a guy. Ladies, you may not get this. You, you probably bow easier than a guy does. This is weird, okay? If I said all guys stand up and bow in the floor in front of your seat, some of y'all would have diarrhea right there, okay? <laughs> because this is, this is awkward. It's not our comfort zone. You know what Daniel said? Daniel said, God, you are God. And this world has nothing in your presence. And so I can bow before you, God. So when I get up, I can stand before the men, before the king of this world. 
That's good. We need to practice that where we humbly posture ourselves before a God that's bigger than we can imagine. Because when we do, when we bow before God, we can then stand with confidence before men. How does that happen? It happens when we praise Him. When we, sometimes on Sunday morning, God is extremely dis, disappointed in the praise of His church. You know? Because often people come to church with a stinking spectator mentality. I'm going to go in hopes of being entertained by a great worship set. I want to hear the band do great. You know, I want to I want to rate them. Well, Caleb, he, you know, he plunked that one string there a little bit weird. I'm going to give him a C. Okay. Um, Gene strung out that harmonica just a little too long right there. Okay. Adam got a little freaky on the drum, banging it. I just want to bang on the drums all day. I don't know what he's doing. And we evaluate, man, the band. We evaluate the band. And meanwhile, God is on the throne and said, won't you, won't you evaluate me? Why don't you bring your evaluation to my table? Won't you look up here and do an investigation and see what you find? Because I think you'll be humbled. I think you'll realize I am God. And, and what the worship team is trying to do is help you get to a place where you can praise and worship our God. I want to challenge you. You'll have the opportunity at the end of this service. We'll sing another song. Don't spectate when God is looking for you to come into his presence. Daniel got it. And he put his he got his big praise on because God deserves it. And then what, what happens is when you realize how little to nothing we are and what we do bring to the table is only because God has given it to us. Okay? I do not pretend. I do not suggest. I do not tell anybody that I'm the brightest bulb on the tree. Okay? I know what goes on in the gray matter here. And you, if you could see inside there, you would run. Okay? I don't suggest that, but I do suggest this. I got a big God who put what's up there up there. I got a big God who wired me, who formed me, who knit me together while yet in my mother's womb. He put me together for a reason, and the way he wired me is to accomplish a particular goal, and he did the same for you. Now, here's what happens. You, don't, you won't ever be utilized by God in, at its greatest level until you praise God because when you praise God, watch this, the next one. Big peace comes in. Big peace comes in. You don't worry about what people think. Now you have confidence because you know God. You know the God who created the people that you're worried about. You know the God who is over the situation that you're walking through. And so you don't worry about it because you praise God. He's great. He's amazing. And all of a sudden, man, it just it's not about me anymore. It's about God and his agenda. Now listen to what Daniel does. Big peace. Verse 24 says, Then Daniel went in to see Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. And he came and said to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Escort me to the king, and I will disclose the interpretation to him. So Arioch quickly ushered Daniel into the king's presence, saying to him, I have found a man from the captives of Judah who can make known the interpretation of the king. Now, big peace. Let's back up a little bit. Daniel now has gone through three years of, uh, he got an, a three-year degree in, in cultural studies, okay? He went to the Babylonian school, learned their language, learned their culture, okay? He's been changed. He's been, uh, everything's different about him, okay? He's, he's been castrated, uh, and, and now what does he do? He says to the henchman, to the hitman, okay? He says to Arioch, the one who came to dismember him and destroy his home, he says, hey, don't destroy the, the guys from Babylon. I need to go see the king. Now keep in mind, he's about 17 or 18 years old. And he looks in the face of the one who has the power to annihilate his existence, who has been given that authority from a ruthless, wicked king whose name was Nebuchadnezzar. And he looks at him and he says, hey, don't destroy him. I got it. He's got a peace, man. He just grew a spine. He just, he, why? Because he bowed before God, he can stand before men. Now, he, he goes on and he tells, he tells the king, he says, he says, I've got what the king needs and there's no worries. Uh, some of us have, have trouble or we struggle getting peace in our heart. And matter of fact, watch this. Let's just look for some transparency. How many of you this week kind of worried about something more than just a few times? Say, yeah, I might have done that. Just say, I might have done that. That's not a full confession. You, you know, just maybe. Maybe I did, maybe I didn't. 
Okay? That's what we do. And often the reason we do it, we don't have that peace, is because we've got everything out of whack. We've, we've not been, done, been faithful about praising a bigger God. And so all of a sudden, ourselves and the world we're in get bigger than God, outside of God's ability to, to fix it and to move in our life. Now, so what happens is we get a praise on, we, hear, we get an answer to prayer, and we just praise God for the greatness of who He is. Okay, And all of a sudden, we get a peace about us where we don't worry about it anymore. We can stand tall in the face of the enemy and just speak the truth and live for the God who created us. Now, watch what God does. When we do that, God realizes that we're real. He watches. He says, well, you're real. You're, you get it. You get it now. I'm God. You're not. I'm God, no other is. I'm large and in charge, and you are my subject. Okay, now that you have that, now I can use you. The next point that he does is he provides a platform, a place for you to be used to impact and change the world around you. And sometimes we feel like we don't have any impact. Well, I've told my friends about Jesus, and they just don't want to hear it. I've invited them to church, and they won't come. Okay, I'm trying to get this promotion at work, and I don't get it. My family's struggling. My children are struggling. My finances are struggling. My world's upside down. They just don't get it. You know why? Often, because we didn't, we, we're all out of sync. We didn't praise him. We didn't worship him for the greatness of who he is. He hasn't developed in us confidence in God, a peace that passes all understanding. And he can't use us yet. Listen, we're building a brand new building over there. I'm sure you saw it when you came up. It's funny, we got that green siding on there. My grandson Judson, we drove down Jim Sturkey Road one day, this about two weeks ago. He goes, Papa, are you kidding me? The church is almost finished. <laughs> and, then, and then somebody later said, is that going to be the color of the church? <laughs> no, it's going to be pink. We just started with green to see what it looks like. No, that's the under siding. That's the den's glass. Now, here, now I don't know why I was going there. Oh, oh, here it is. So God's growing our church. Yeah, whoo, okay. And I know he's going to use me because I know how he can take a mess and turn it into a message. I know that. I know that. But you, listen, it's not about me. It's about the church. It's about you. It's about us. It's about we. It's about God using you. Listen, every single person in here, say this. He's talking to me now. Say it. I'm talking to you now, okay. Every person in here. God wants to use you to impact your world. God wants to use you as an ambassador, as an instrument, as a channel for God to speak into somebody's life so that they can get to know the same God that you say that you know. But it happens in a sequence of events where we have to get things right. Listen to what happens now. He says in verse 26, So the king then asked Daniel, whose name was also Belteshazzar, that's his ungodly uh, Babylonian name it says are you able to make known to me the dream that I saw as well as as its interpretation you remember that's the question if you can't do that I'm gonna chop you up in pieces and destroy your family that's what he said but if you can do it I'm gonna reward you he went both ways and so he goes on and he says Daniel replied to the king the mystery that the king is asking about is such that no wise man astrologer magician or diviner can possibly disclose it to the king he says, listen, what you've asked for is a little bit unreasonable and unrealistic. In fact, it can't happen. So the king says, okay, you've got an audience with me. You're going to tell me my dream. You're going to interpret it. Basically, Daniel, this 17, 18-year-old boy, looks at one of the most ruthless leaders in world history, and he said, no, not, I don't have that. But watch what he does. He says, however, but there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to the king Nebuchadnezzar um, what will happen in the times to come. And the dream and the visions you had while lying on your bed are as follows. As for the king, let me pause right there. Go back to that last slide for me if you don't mind, Will. I want you to notice this is a part of a verse. You know, we don't, we don't do um, memory verses very well. A matter of fact, I could embarrass us all, including myself. I said, give me 25 verses. From the Bible. You know how you're going to come in strong. Well, I got that Jesus wept one. That's a two-worder. I've got the pray without ceasing. That's a three-worder. I'm growing, tra getting some traction. Okay. I'm going to jump out there with the John 3.16. I pretty much have that. It might be paraphrased. I got bits and pieces of the 23rd Psalm, which I got a whole stinking chapter. That ought to get me some points. And then it's like, we start running out quick, right? 
you know. And if we do know a verse, we don't have an address. We don't know if it's in the Old Testament or the New Testament or in the index or somebody wrote it in the back. We, we, ain't got, we don't have a clue, okay. So I'm going to show you a part of a verse that you need to commit to memory. In your darkest time, in your greatest time, in the time when you feel the presence of God in your life, I want you to be mindful of this. He tells Daniel, do you know this? Daniel says, what you've asked for is nobody knows. Here it is. You ready? However, there is a God in heaven. Never forget, man. Never forget. There is a God, Yahweh, Jehovah, true and living creator, sustainer of the universe, the one who spoke nothing, spoke everything out of nothing. There is a God in heaven. No matter where you are, no matter what situation you find yourself in, no matter what dilemma of the world you might be walking through, never, never, never forget there's a God in heaven. It's just that simple. Now, okay, back to the next verse. Now he's going to begin and he's going to unpack what it is that the dream is all about. He says, as for you, O king, while you were in your bed, your thoughts turned to future things. And he says, the revealer of the mysteries has made known to you what's going to take place. As for me, this mystery was revealed to me, not because I possess more wisdom. Again, Daniel's saying, just so you know, man, I got nothing. I'm just a Hebrew guy that got deported, shipped over here to your land. I really don't bring that much to the table, but there's a God in heaven, okay? It all, he's always pointing to God. And he says, uh, but so that the king may understand the interpretation and comprehend the thoughts of your mind, you, O king, we're watching as a great statue, one of impressive size and extraordinary brightness, was standing before you, and its appearance caused alarm. As for that statue, its head was fine gold. Its chest and arms were of silver. Its belly and thighs were of bronze. He continues to go down the statue in his dream. And he says its legs were of iron, and its feet were partly of iron and partly of clay. You were watching as a stone was cut out but not by human hands and it struck the statue on its iron and clay feet breaking them into pieces then the iron the clay the bronze the silver and the gold were broken into pieces without distinction and it became like chafe from the summer threshing floor that the wind carries away not a trace of them could be found but the stone was struck but the stone that struck the statue became a large mountain that filled the entire earth. This was the dream. Now we will set forth before the king its interpretation. Now, here's Daniel. He's just a he's just a, 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 a older teen, maybe 17, 18 years old. And he's looking at the king and he says, I'm gonna tell you what you saw. Now, he begins to unfold or unpack what it is the king has seen in a dream. Just for the record, there are no such thing as a mind reader. That nobody can read your mind. Nobody can tell you what you dreamed last night. You can tell them, but they can't tell you. God knows even what we dream. Isn't that scary? It's kind of scary, isn't it? He knows what we think. He knows what we say. He knows what we listen to. He knows the focus of our heart. He knows what we dreamed last night. Sometimes we have those dreams. You know, anybody got the weird dreams? Anybody have weird dreams like, like crackhead weird dreams? Anybody have those? I have those. And I wake up and I'm, yeah, I wake up and I'm like, what in the world? Where did that even come from? You know? Does that mean anything? You know, God even knows what we dream. He's God. He's all-knowing. All right? So Daniel now looks at the king. He says, I'm going to tell you about this dream. He, he begins by telling his dream. First, he says the head was fine gold. As we read further, and we're going to skip a little bit apart, I'm going to tell you what he means, what this means. He says the head was fine gold. He says, Nebuchadnezzar, that's you. The head is you. You see, Babylon was, was known as the golden nation. Because it had pillaged and plundered and taken captive all of these smaller nations. And when they did, they took all of their gold. So they had these <clears throat> masses of gold. And everything in the kingdom was like lathed in gold. The, everything was about gold. You know, it, was, it, 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 it was who they were. We'll see more of this in chapter 3. And so it was called the golden nation. He says, the head is you. But then he goes on and he says, the chest and arms were of silver. Now, what Daniel is getting ready to do, based on the following verses, is he's going to tell him what's going to happen in the future, that his kingdom will not stand. His ruling power will come to an end. 
And he says, number two, when you move down, you're going to see a chest and arms of silver. There's two parts here. He didn't know it, but in 539, keep in mind, Nebuchadnezzar took, uh, took captive Babylon in 605 B.C. In 539 B.C., whatever that is, 66 years later, okay, he's going to lose his power. And he's going to be taken captive by two adjoining nations that become an alliance. And it's the Medes and the Persians. And they're going to take over and destroy Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. And they're going to wipe him out. And, and that is called the chest of, of and arms of silver. And then he goes on down the statue, on down the body. And he looks at the belly and the thighs. And he says they were bronze. Just a few years after 539, well, in 340 B.C., there would be another ruler that would come in and wipe out the Medes and the Persians. And this would be the Grecian ruler, a rule under Alexander the Great. And strangely enough, the soldiers wore helmets, shields, and breastplates out of bronze because bronze was stronger than gold. Bronze is, 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 is extremely strong. And so he tells him, that kingdom's going to end and then he goes on down the body and he says the legs, they were of iron. In 50 B.C., the, 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 the conquering power was Rome, the, the power that was in place when Jesus was crucified on a cross. And he says the Roman Empire will come into place and they will be a power of iron. And then he goes on, he says, now this is where he moves even further into a prophecy that hasn't yet been fulfilled. He says his feet are to be made of clay and iron. In other words, it's going to look strong, it's going to look ironish, but at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's contaminated with clay, and so it's brittle. What this is, according to Revelation, is called the ten, the ten country allegiance, the alliance of ten countries led by the Antichrist in the, in the end times, okay? That hasn't happened yet, but, but here's the point. He says, all, he says, I want you to know, king, I want you to know, church, Every one of those leaders, every one of those uh, world powerhouses, all of those world leaders, they're dead, buried, and their kingdom destroyed. They're gone. And yet in the moment, it seems so big, so powerful, so undefeatable, so, so everything the world is looking for. But they have a day and a season, and then it's over. Why? You remember what he said? God deposes some kings and he establishes others it's all in God's hands according to God's timeline now he goes on because sometimes we stop reading too soon now we get to verse 34 I'm, excuse me in the days of those kings got heaven here we go verse 44 I'm sorry verse 44 it says in the days of those kings the the, the ten nation alliance he said the God of heaven will raise up an everlasting kingdom. So we see already it's a, there's, a, there's a kingdom coming that's different than every other kingdom, world power that's ever existed. And he says, uh, that will not be destroyed and a kingdom that will not be left to another people. You see, all of these other kingdoms, they had people who came after them and built upon their power and their, their success. This kingdom, it comes from God and it will not be left to be ruled by anybody else. Now watch what, it, what he says. He says, it will break in pieces and bring about the demise of all of these kingdoms, but it will stand forever. 45 says, you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain, but not by human hands. Very important. It smashed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold into pieces. And the great God has made known to the king what will occur in the future. The dream is certain and its interpretation is reliable. 46 says, Then the king Nebuchadnezzar bowed down with his face to the ground and he paid homage to Daniel. He gave orders to, the, to offer sacrifice and incense to him. Now, first of all, that last verse, that sometimes people say, So Nebuchadnezzar, man, he believed in God. Notice what he said. He bowed down with his face to the ground and paid homage to Daniel. You remember how many times Daniel said, It ain't about me, it's about a big, big God. Sometimes we say that, but when things turn around and we get out of the dilemma of the world, all of a sudden, just like it could have happened here, the world wants to applaud us. The world wants to say, a boy, good job. And sometimes the default mode is to kind of embrace that. 
yeah, it's kind of good to be me, okay? It's, it's good to be me, when in reality, it's not. It's good that God is God. Now, in this verse, he also goes, he refers to this stone that's cut out of a mountain, okay? And it's not made with human hands. 2,600 years ago, the king of Babylon had a dream. And in that dream, there is a stone not made with human hands that comes onto the scene and destroys all worldly, earthly kingdoms. 2,600 years ago, 600 years before Jesus even got here, Jesus has yet to return to establish this kingdom on earth, but he will. But he will, and there's nothing that anybody could do. Let, let me just tell you, Jesus is the stone, not formed with human hands. Virgin Mary, a young girl, had never been with a man. She's engaged, but she was pure. The Holy Spirit of God came upon her and, and made her pregnant with the Son of God, the Messiah of the world, Jesus, not made with human hands. He came into this world lived a perfect life to die, a perfect sacrificial death upon a cross. They took his dead body, they placed it in a stone, and out of that stone would rise from the dead Jesus, the Son of God, demonstrating his power over death, hell, and the grave. Jesus would walk among men for 40 days, revealing himself, eating with people, hanging out with his disciples, only to ascend to heaven. And he has been there for about 2,000 years. I want you to know something. The story is not over yet the best is yet to come for the believer I'm telling you I'm telling you there's nothing there's nothing no prophetic event that needs to take place to usher in the return of Jesus Jesus at any moment at any day in this very moment right now God could look over to his right hand to his son and say Jesus go get your church the Bible says Listen to what it, some of these verses, 1 Corinthians 10, 4. In the, in the Bible, over 15 times, Jesus is referred to as a rock or the stone. 1 Corinthians 10, 4, it says, For they were all drinking from the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ Jesus. Isaiah 28, 16, it says, Look, I am laying a stone in Zion. An approved stone set in place as a precious cornerstone for the foundation. The one who maintains his faith will not panic. Jesus is the rock. Jesus is the stone. Jesus is the kingdom that will rule all kingdoms and smash and obliterate and annihilate every other world kingdom that's ever existed or will exist in the future. And so for the, sometimes we live in a world where it feel, you feel a little defeated, you feel a little, um, a little disappointed that, you know, the world just doesn't all believe Jesus. And so when somebody says, are you a Christian, you answer like this, yeah, okay. When, when somebody says, tell me about that, what does it mean to be a Christian? Well, I'm a, I was a sinner and one day I was in church and the preacher told me that Jesus died on a cross for me, rose from the dead. And if I placed my faith in that and say a prayer, I'd be a Christian, so I believe in Jesus, he saved me. End of story. That's not Christianity. That's not what Jesus died on a cross to give you. Jesus died on a cross. God himself encapsulated himself in flesh and bone, came from heaven, lived on this earth, died on a cross. So when your life came along, your miserable, sinful, my sinful, wretched life came along, Jesus was saying, look down and say, man, I love you just like you are. But I love you way too much to leave you there. I want to I want to come into your world and radically change you. I want to wash you as white as snow, fill you with my spirit, seal you with my spirit, put you on a new journey, and let's live this life of excitement together. And one day I'm going to come get you, and we'll spend eternity together in heaven, but not short of a thousand years on this earth in peace. That's what it's supposed to be like. Like your Christian life should be exciting. You should be excited that the God of the universe, the God that Daniel said there is a God in heaven, he came on a rescue mission for you, for your DNA, for your personality, for your person, for your sin, for who you are, for your name. He came just for you if there was no other. And so you should be stoked about that to the place that when an opportunity to praise God comes along, you're the first one in. When a band comes up to sing, you ought to be the first one standing. Let's go. Okay? Because he's a big, big God. Okay? And until that happens in your life, I just be, you know, I'm real. 
until that happens in your life, you can, you will live a mediocre, lukewarm, apathetic, miserable Christian experience. How do I know? I walked it for years. I walked in it for years. And my goal is to help people not be like me, but to be like Jesus. Because the more we get like Jesus, the more we experience the greatness of God in our life. So, how does all that happen when this rock not made with human hands? How does that, like, connect to us? You ready? 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16. It says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven. Jesus himself will come down from heaven with the shout of command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead, of, the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive, who are left, will be suddenly caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. And so here it is. Nothing has to happen for that event to occur. There's nothing left undone. Any moment, God can say, go get them. And the trumpet blows. Jesus descends from heaven. He, it's not the second coming. He stops in the air on the clouds. And he catches away. That's what it says. We use the word rapture. He catches away first those who are dead in Christ. Those who were saved that died. They get resurrected from their grave. Reunited with a new glorified, uh, new glorified body. Those of us that remain, if he comes today, I'm still here, not dead, okay? He takes me out, and he equips my body for the trip. I get a glorified body. We go to heaven. There we dwell for seven years with Jesus as our king in heaven. God on his throne in worship for seven years. Activities happen there. Meanwhile, on this earth, hell breaks loose. It's called the Great Tribulation. For seven years, all of the wrath of Satan himself, all of the wrath of God is poured out on this earth. And it's terrible and unbelievably bad. But at the, at the end of the seven years, God says, okay, Jesus, now go back. And he comes back and he brings somebody with him. It's not the angels. It's you. It's me. It's those who he took home to heaven. He prepared us for the great battle. We come to earth and Jesus wipes it all clean, destroys the enemy. And we rule and reign with Jesus on this earth for a thousand years. It's unbelievable. Um, unbelievably, unbelievably beautiful story. Nobody can write a story like this but God, the story writer. And that's what's going to happen. Revelation twenty two twenty says, The one who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Je this is Jesus speaking. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, which should be our prayer. I'll finish up. We're going to move on down to verse 48. Lastly. I want to tell you, when you live for God, when you praise God, when you let God do great things in your life, when he develops a platform for you, when you get it right, you don't have to worry about anything. You don't have to worry. Why? Because God is the God of big provisions. Look what it says now, the big provision. Look what God does in the life of Daniel. 48 says, then the king, Nebuchadnezzar, he elevated Daniel to high position, and he bestowed on him many marvelous gifts. He granted him authority over the entire province of Babylon and made him the main prefect, hold on right there, Will, over all the wise men of Babylon. And hold on right there. So listen what he does. He takes care of Daniel. God looks out for those who look to God. Oh, never said that before. I like it. God looks out for those who look to God. And he's taking care of Daniel. So what about his boys? What about his little posse he had there that he walked a thousand miles with? Kind of forgot his buddies, I guess. Watch this, verse 49. It says, And at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's their ungodly Babylonian names. His friends. He appointed them over the administration of the province of Babylon. Daniel himself served in the king's court. You know, we get so hung up sometimes on taking care of ourselves. Worrying about provision for ourselves and our family. Meanwhile, there's a God in heaven. And he'll provide for us. He is the provider. He is the great provision. 
The question is whether or not we will allow him to take care of us or if we will choose to take care of ourselves. Most of us, we choose to take care of ourselves. And with that, I want you to bow your heads for a minute as the worship team comes forward. And I want you to think for a second. Does your life have some big problems? Is there stuff going on in your world that's bigger than you are right now? It may be relationship. It may be wayward children. It may be disappointments. It may be a career. It may be a sickness. Just problems. How do you know if you have them? The thing that you think about most, that's your problem. I want you to right now just pray to God regarding your big problems and ask him to help you see the big possibilities in your problems. And now I want you just to pray that God will begin to turn those problems into possibilities just ask him God here I am you're my father and I'm your child I'm asking for intervention I'm asking that you do what I can't do for myself I'm asking that you move supernaturally in my problem and turn it into a possibility and in the coming days I'm going to be looking for an answer it may come as a dream. It may come as a, uh, an activity or an action in this world. But I'm going to be looking, God, because I trust you. And when you answer my prayer, I'm going to get my praise on. I'm just going to tell everybody. I'm going to tell you how much I love you, how much I appreciate the fact that you chose to answer my prayer. It's going to be hard to shut me up, God, because I'm going to praise your great name for what you've done. And don't let me stop there, God. Use what you do in my life as a platform to encourage those around me that might have big problems in their life. And help me with every passing day begin to surrender to the fact that you are the greatest provision this world has ever known. The greatest need that mankind has ever had is our lost condition in need of forgiveness of our sin in need of of being right with you and God you even made provision for that through Jesus your son and now God as pastor it's my prayer that if there's someone in here today that they've never received Jesus into their life to make them right with you that great provision that only you could give I pray that your Holy Spirit would reach into the depth of their soul and invite them into your presence. And God, I pray that they would be willing to respond by saying, God, I know I'm a sinner. And I believe you've provided Jesus to make a way for me to get to you. I want Jesus to come into my life, not just to save me, but to be my new king, my new master and my new Lord. Thank you, God, for being so good. Thank you for being, in particular, so good to me. In Jesus' name, amen. Maybe you prayed a prayer today that you, was, that you felt God heard your prayer. You felt that you were serious about your prayer. This altar is open in the last song. If you want to come and bow and just pray to kind of drive a stake in it, to make a mark on your calendar, that's the day I left it at the altar. If you just ask Jesus to save you, you need to go public with that. You need to contact the church and let us know so we can help you in your new journey moving forward with Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And with that, let's stand and worship our God. Amen.
beautiful Sunday that we've had to come and worship you, Father, and just hear what you have, what you have for us with Pastor Joel's message. Lord, we ask you to be with us as we go this evening and protect us through the week. Lord, help us to